Hey guys, today's video lecture topic is meiosis. As always, please make sure you're filling out your notes organizer as you watch this video. You can stop, pause, rewatch as many times as you need to to make sure you answer every question. So like I said, the topic today is the meiosis cell cycle. The meiosis cell cycle is the process of cell division that is necessary for sexual reproduction. So hopefully you know by now that every cell in your body called your somatic cells, all the normal cells of your body have 46 chromosomes, a set of 23 that you got from your biological mother and a set of 23 that you got from your biological father, right? 23 was carried in the egg, 23 was carried in the sperm. When the egg and the sperm united during fertilization, that chromosome number was restored to 46. The fertilized egg, the zygote, had 46 chromosomes. That cell undergoes mitosis so that all of the cells in the body have 46 chromosomes. That pair of chromosomes that carry the same genes are called homologous chromosomes. So paired chromosomes with the same genes, one that you got from each parent. They don't necessarily carry the same instructions, but they carry the same genes. We'll get more into that when we study genetics later this year. So you can see here on this karyotype, is a somatic karyotype. It has 46 chromosomes, two sets of 23. One set you got from mom, one set you got from dad. That 23rd pair is what tells us whether this is the karyotype of a male or a female. Now, every cell in your body is a somatic cell except for one type of cell. That is the gametes, right? Gametes are sex cells. So eggs in females, sperm in males. All the other cells in your body are what we call somatic cells. Gametes contain 23 chromosomes, or what we call a haploid number of chromosomes. A cell that contains two sets of chromosomes are what we call a diploid cell. These are your somatic cells. We represent that with the number 2n because there are two sets of chromosomes. In the case of humans, two sets of 23 in a diploid somatic cell. But your gametes have half the number of chromosomes. We call that haploid, we represent that with just N, right? A single set of chromosomes. Uh, so you can see in this picture here, diploid cells have double the amount of DNA that haploid cells. All the cells of your body are diploid somatic cells, except for your gametes, your sex cells, which are haploid. So why do sex cells need to have half the number of chromosomes? Because unlike all of your other cells, they do something very unique. They combine during fertilization. So an organism produces gametes so that they can maintain the same number of chromosomes from generation to generation. If your gametes were diploid, then when they joined in fertilization, we'd be starting out with something other than uh, you know, 46, which is not good. So we need egg cells and sperm cells to have half the number of chromosomes so that when they unite during fertilization, that chromosome number is restored, in the case of humans, to 46 in that zygote, that fertilized egg. This sexual life cycle, the ability to reproduce sexually, requires a process for making sex cells, and that process is called meiosis. So the goal of meiosis is to produce gametes, sex cells. That's the only type of cell that is produced from this cell cycle process. When gametes combine during fertilization, that is when that haploid number is restored to the diploid number. Okay. So sometimes you will hear meiosis referred to as a reduction division. You are reducing the number of chromosomes by half as you divide the cells, okay? By separating those homologous chromosomes, you are reducing the number from diploid to haploid. So sometimes you'll hear it called a reduct reduction division. In order to do this, we have to divide the cell two times. So we call each stage of meiosis, meiosis one and meiosis two. So you have the dance of the chromosomes that we call, we talk about in mitosis, that kind of happens twice in meiosis. So in order to produce gametes, sex cells that are haploid at the end of meiosis, you have to duplicate the DNA once, but you have to divide the cells twice. So you duplicate the DNA once before the cell division, but then you go through two meiosis cycles. So you divide the cell twice, which means you end up with four genetically different haploid daughter cells. That is very different from mitosis.
Okay, so let's get into the details of meiosis, starting with interphase. Interphase of the meiosis cell cycle is very similar to the interphase happening in mitosis. The cell is growing, the cell is carrying out normal cell functions, and the DNA is replicating. The really the big difference is that this is happening in what we call germ cells, which are your reproductive cells that will eventually become sperm and egg. Okay, so now we're going to get into the first uh, division of meiosis, what we call meiosis 1. So within meiosis 1, there's a PMAT, prophase 1, metaphase 1, anaphase 1, and telophase 1. In prophase 1, some unique things happen here. This is a huge, huge stage. Highlight this box, star it, bold it, capitalize it, whatever you need to do to make sure you signify the importance of prophase 1. This is where all the big stuff is happening. So just like in mitosis, we have the formation of chromosomes, but here's something huge that happens differently in prophase one of meiosis. The homologous chromosomes, after they duplicate, pair up. We call that a tetrad when they're in this stage. That's a tetrad because it has four kind of parts to it, right? Four chromatids. So when they pair up, they do this thing called crossing over. This is all happening in prophase one. Just like in prophase of mitosis, the spindle fibers are starting to form from the centrioles and the nuclear membrane is breaking down. But let's talk a little bit more about that whole crossing over thing. Crossing over produces an exchange of genetic information. During crossing over, chromosomal segments are literally exchanged between a pair of homologous chromosomes. So we have two homologous chromosomes, right, that have been duplicated they kind of pair up and they hold their little chromosome hands. And when they hold their little chromosome hands, they form that tetrad, a little piece of genetic information from one gets swapped with the other. It's almost as if you and I were standing next to each other wearing baseball caps. And I took my baseball cap off and I put it on you and you took your baseball cap off and you put it on me. We exchanged a little bit of information. That's kind of what crossing over is. That creates genetic variation. This is why your sister, if you're a girl, your sister is not exactly like you. This is why if you are a boy, your brother is not exactly like you. Part of the reason for that is because of crossing over. That happens, up, happens during prophase one of meiosis. Okay, then we have metaphase one. In metaphase one, just like in mitosis, metaphase of mitosis, the chromosomes line up. But remember, they were just holding their little chromosome hands. They were just paired up and crossing over in prophase one. So in metaphase one, they line up in their homologous pairs. They are not single file like they were in metaphase of mitosis. They're lined up in pairs. So just like in mitosis, the chromosome centromeres attach to the spindle fibers. The big difference is that they are just lined up side by side, not single file. So when they get pulled apart during anaphase one, it's an entire chromosome that is heading to the pole. Okay, in anaphase one of meiosis one, the homologous chromosome pairs separate and full chromosomes are pulled by those shortening spindle fibers to the opposite poles of a cell. That is different than anaphase of mitosis, right? In anaphase of mitosis, a chromatid was being pulled to the pole. We have a pair of chromosomes that was separated, so now an entire chromosome is being pulled to the pole in anaphase one of meiosis. So in telophase one, Similar to telophase of mitosis, the chromosomes uncoil, two nuclei reform, the cell begins to divide, the spindle fibers break down. Some organisms, cells, will go through a cytokinesis here, but others will jump right into meiosis two of, um, you know, prophase two of meiosis two. So that's what we're gonna do. So at this point, following meiosis one, we have what we call two haploid daughter cells. But here's where things get kind of tricky and we're gonna talk about this more later. The chromosomes themselves are considered haploid, but we don't really have a haploid amount of genetic information yet, okay? We have to divide the cells one more time in order to end up with a haploid amount of genetic information. We'll talk about this more later. Right now, I need you to know that at this stage, we do consider the cells haploid, but we need them to divide one more time to end up with a true amount of haploid genetic information in our final cells. All right, so now we're going on to prophase two of meiosis two. Here's a hint, you guys. 
Meiosis II is basically the same as mitosis. The only difference is in mitosis, you're going from one cell to two cells. In meiosis II, you're going from two cells to four cells. But basically the dance of the chromosomes in meiosis II is exactly the same as the dance of the chromosomes in mitosis. Okay, so in prophase two of, my, of meiosis, very similar to prophase of mitosis, the chromosomes are condensing the back into chromosomes, the nucleus is breaking down, the spindle fibers are forming. The difference here is that we have two cells, right? We do not have crossing over happening here. They're not pairing up, they're not crossing over. That only happens in prophase one of meiosis. In metaphase two of meiosis, again, just like mitosis, the chromosomes line up now single file across the equator, just like they did in mitosis metaphase. Okay, so metaphase two, they're lined up single file. That's different than metaphase one. In metaphase one, they're lined up in pairs. So anaphase two is just like anaphase of mitosis. The chromosomes are getting yanked apart. So now the chromatids are being pulled at their centromere by those shortening spindle fibers. So chromatids are being pulled towards the opposite poles. In anaphase one, a whole chromosome was heading to the pole. But in anaphase two, it's just like mitosis. A chromatid is being pulled to the pole. And then finally, we have telophase two, which is where the chromosomes reach the pole. And now we have four nuclear membranes and four nuclei that are reforming so that you end up with four daughter cells. So finally, cytokinesis, the cutting of the cytoplasm, we have four distinct haploid cells each with an N number of chromosomes. In the case of humans, that N number is 23. So we produce four cells that have 23 chromosomes. Now, just a bit of interesting information. This does happen a little bit differently in males and females. So the creation of sperm is called spermatogenesis. Genesis means creation, so we're creating sperm. And the creation of eggs in females is called oogenesis because an egg is called an ovum. So in spermatogenesis, you produce four true mature sperm cells. But in oogenesis, and we're not entirely sure why this happens, pretty much all the cytoplasm and organelles get, get pushed to one cell. And so you end up with three cells that are what we call polar bodies, which do not mature into an egg cell. And only one of the four cells matures into a true egg cell that is capable of fertilization. Okay. So let's sum up some big picture things here. Let's talk about the importance of meiosis. One of the big things about meiosis is that we produce four haploid daughter cells that are not identical to each other. They result in genetic variation. Um, meiosis produces gametes, genetically varied gametes. Why do we need genetic variation? Because remember, genetic variation leads to a stronger species. So where does that genetic variation come from? We know that it can come from crossing over. We talked about that already, okay? That's down here. Genetic variation can be produced during crossing over. And then of course, we know that genetic variation depends on which egg gets fertilized by which sperm. But also genetic variation can depend on how the chromosomes line up and separate, okay? Depending on how they line up is gonna make different combinations of chromosomes that can result in your final daughter cells. Now, what if something goes wrong during meiosis? That's a really big deal because you're creating egg and sperm and egg and sperm come together to form the first cell, right? So if there is a mistake in the egg or the sperm, that's gonna affect every single cell of that developing embryo. So we call a mistake during meiosis non-disjunction. Non-disjunction is the failure of one or more chromosomes to separate correctly, resulting in the abnormal distribution of chromosomes in the final daughter cells. So this is what meiosis is supposed to look like. This is normal meiosis. We start with this amount of chromosomes here, and we end up with a haploid number of chromosomes in our four daughter cells. In non-disjunction, something happens to where a chromosome doesn't separate correctly, either during meiosis one or meiosis two. So you can see in this abnormal meiosis, 
we, this chromosome didn't separate, so we ended up with a cell that has too much genetic information, and we ended up with a cell that has not enough genetic information. Now, if let's say these are eggs. If this is the egg that's fertilized by the sperm, that's not a big deal, because that's a normal, healthy cell. But if this egg or this egg gets fertilized by the sperm, that's gonna be a problem. You're gonna end up with cells that have an incorrect amount of genetic information. This is why trisomy 21, or what you've probably heard called Down syndrome, exists. Down syndrome is an example of a genetic disorder that is a result of non-disjunction. You have one too many 21st chromosomes in every cell, right? That happened because there was a 21st chromosome that ended up uh, in an egg or a sperm when it wasn't supposed to be there. So when that egg or sperm was fertilized, it had too many 21st chromosomes. So every cell at that point has too many chromosome 21. So this karyotype right here would be a male with trisomy 21. Okay, so it's important to understand how we get from a gamete to an embryo. Remember, a gamete is a haploid sex cell, so an egg or a sperm. Fertilization is when that chromosome number is restored to 46. That fertilized egg is what we call a zygote. The zygote is the first somatic cell, okay? That's the first diploid body cell. So then the question is, well, how do we go from a zygote to an embryo? That is where we need mitosis. Okay, so we have a zygote, a fertilized egg, that is now going to go through mitosis to make more of those cells. So whatever is in the cell in the zygote is gonna be in every cell in the embryo because that cell is gonna go through mitosis. All right, last thing, big comparison differences between mitosis and meiosis. You're gonna wanna stop on this uh, page right here and get some of this jotted down. That's all I have for you today. I hope you're having a wonderful day.